and Councillor Schreider are absent. All other members are present. And we're nearing the 6.30 mark. So Mr. Mayor, whenever you're ready, you may commence the meeting. Okay, we'll just wait till 6.30. There it is, all right. And then we'll call the order of this committee at the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Sogging Shores and say uh, good evening and welcome to all members of the committee and to all members of the public who are joining us via the live stream this evening, we're glad that you're with us. The second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if you have one of those you'd like to declare at this time. Seeing none, of course, you could do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda. We do have three open forum requests this evening. And I'll just remind all uh, those who are going to give an open forum presentation that they are three minutes in length. So we'll ask you to keep to that uh, time frame and we'll give you a heads up when you hit it. Um, so the first one is uh, Patricia Corrigan Frank, and she's here to talk to us regarding item 7.7.2 update to Cedar Crescent Village. Ms. Frank, are you with us? I see yes, I am. Here. Okay, do you have your video or are you coming in without a video tonight? Oh, nope. there you are. There we go. Okay. All, set. All, right. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. On behalf of the Port Elgin Beach Preservers, we wish to reiterate once again, that we are totally behind beautification and renewal of the Port Elgin waterfront. The new concept plan for the Cedar Crescent Village announced Friday is a huge improvement environmentally. However, it still includes 32,000 square feet of connected commercial buildings adjacent to Harbor Street stretching from Elgin to Mill. In the town of Sogging Shore zoning laws 752006, this site is zoned OS1 with possible uses to include a restaurant, recreational facilities, boat and bicycle rentals, and a boat clubhouse. And any accessory retail facilities existing on the date of passing of this bylaw. These buildings do not meet this bylaw qualification. A planning justification report should have been submitted and the site rezoned to commercial to allow for the proposed businesses in this new construction. Simply having a lease agreement does not exempt the proponent from submitting a planning app application. According to the Ontario government's guide to building permits, you must obtain a building permit before you excavate or construct a foundation, construct any new building over 10 square meters, or install a repair and on-site sewage system. The plan going forward to start excavating a foundation by December 3rd is not legal until such a building permit is approved. The report being presented by Ms. Van Mile this evening provides no policy direction to lead council to make an informed decision about this revised site plan and thus provides them with no legislative authority to approve this decision. Normally, with a new development, and that is exactly what this is, it is town staff who would lead a proponent to Bruce County website to submit an application and then the applicant would fill out the necessary forms, making sure that the application conformed with the Planning Act the provincial policy statement, the town's official plan, the environmental constraints found in the town's bylaws, as well as any other reports or studies that were required. It's the staff's responsibility to lead or guide the proponent to policy direction and the submission of a planning application. The town has completed an SVCA permit application, but no planning application to Bruce County. Now, why is that? In June 2019, the SBCA in the pre-consult process outlined the necessary policy direction, referring the town to the provincial policy statement, Sogging Shore's official plan policies for hazard lanes and the zoning bylaws. So where is the policy direction here to lead council to make a decision as it relates to this new concept plan? Any recommendation to amend the site plan or lease must be deferred and is not supported by any documentation for the council to review in order for them to make a reasoned decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frank. Uh, that moves us then on to our uh, second uh, open forum, which is from Paul Luco, and he's here to speak to us once again to 7.7.2 update to Cedar Crescent Village. Uh, and there he is, Mr. Luco, the floor is yours, sir. Now you're on mute, uh, still there if you're... There you go. Is that better? Yep, we got you. Okay, uh, just I'm um, trying to get my head around uh, the CCP development issues that have been coming up, answers I've gotten from previous emails and reports. First item, uh, net zero change. I still have a really, really hard time getting my head around the fact that council is willing to accept a net zero change in parking availability at the main beach 
taking into account growth, tourism, <coughs> the, everything that's going to be changing at the beach, and we're still willing to accept a zero change in parking. Unbelievable. Uh, the timing and planning. Uh, the last response I got to my email about the summer parking issues was the response was a promised public information center and all other aspects of the design of the parking areas are on hold at this time. Before the design of the parking areas can be advanced, the final design of the CCB needs to be approved. How does that make sense? We're gonna approve the, the, the design and then we're gonna look at the parking issues that it creates. Um, my next concern, the competition and mixed use of the space. We are basically taking a playgrounds parking lot and throwing a commercial entity into the mix. The worst thing in my uh, career as, as, as a hydro and management was setting up situations where my commercial vehicles or company vehicles were in an area where there were children and families playing. And we are consciously doing that now. We are putting a very, very bad mix together. And potentially answers to this situation are we're gonna create drop-offs to do with the overflow. Um, who's gonna use these drop-offs? Single families, people with disabilities, older people. How can you possibly drop off a family at the beach and then go and park your car and expect them to be there when you come back? It simply doesn't make sense. There's not enough room right now the way it's being planned for all users. Um, the laws involved in this, zoning bylaws. The only parking exemptions within your own town bylaws are within the commercial core. The bylaw clearly defines the requirements. Will the bylaw be changed before final approvals for the town knowingly break its own bylaw? And then that's my only question there on the bylaws is simply, they're very, very clear on what can be done outside the core. I've uh, done a couple of different presentations before to council on my first one, my opinion of the beaches, my pronunciation of names were both challenged. Even my reasons for speaking were challenged, but the data I provided was factual and accurate. I challenged the town, town to dispute it, but it never happened, which means my facts, in my opinion, stand. I sent a letter recently to discuss or do a review of the parking in 2021. I took the challenge to monitor it. I, was, I sent the email, I got no responses. And I just acknowledge that the demand is increasing. And for the first time this year, there was actually people parking on the tennis courts because the demand was so high. Um, one issue that was brought up continuously in my presentations as well as others. I'm just hitting that three minutes there, Mr. Lucos, if you could wrap it up. Two seconds left, thank you. Um, we're elections. We're all in a hurry to delay this issue until we get to next year's election. Well, I challenge anyone who says that you're all elected officials. And if you are confident that you're doing the right thing for the town with the right number of people behind you, the elections become a non-issue. It means that you'll get your support next year just as you have now. Uh, final comments, the main beach is going under significant change. There are many issues still to be resolved and they have to be resolved before you give that final approval for the plan. I remind you, you have absolute discretion on the final plans and schedules for that development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that moves us then on to our final open forum for this evening. It's from Steve Rowland, and he is also here to speak to us on 7.72, update to Cedar Crescent Village. And do we have Mr. Rowland? Well, there he is, I see his name. Are you there, Steve? I'm unmuted. Am I, there, can you yep, see I, me? I can hear you, I can't see you. Can you get your uh, camera going? All I would, the camera was working, but I'll watch this. Up oh, there you are. We found you. All right. The floor now, is yours. Before Steve. I start, before I start and your timer starts, you know the timer's you, starting now, Mr. Rowland. Well, so you, you gotta you get you know that Jamie Smith and Kirsten Schreider, Fort Elgin Council Awards were not are not present tonight. Their their presence is required in order to give proper representation to the constituents of that ward, since it's mostly negatively impacted by this CCV development. Anyways, I'll get to my point. I didn't know that was gonna be part of my three minutes, so I was gonna ask it back. I'm in I'm Mayor and council and staff, I'm formally expressing my objection for the new CCV site and footprint proposed on tonight's agenda. The physical distance from this resident, from my residence in this 32,000 square foot multi-story commercial development has been reduced to a mere 30 meters and undoubtedly presents a significant disruption to my family, livelihood, and to our right to a responsible and reasonable response, uh, enjoyment of my property on Harbor Street per the charter rights. These, these lands have never been subjected to the level of development, size, and scope simultaneously in the history of the Port Elgin Beach. Add in the many environmental concerns, and there is certainly good reason to reassess this project. SVCA processes should not be seen as an encumbrance, but an asset. 
My wife and I just recently experienced the SAS event, September 17th and 18th on the proposed CCD site. Several event organizers are also CCD investors. I felt this event will be a good test. A glimpse into the future of my family and others living nearby will be subjected to it permanently if the CCD progresses. No bylaws, permits, council staff reviews, or response to my inquiries protected me from what turned out to be an intolerable condition to anyone to be subjected to on a regular basis. Opportunity existed for event coordinators to showcase how well a licensed outdoor event could be done, including courtesy and respect to nearby residents, yet they failed miserably. Bands played late both nights and excessive volumes that were heard uptown. We couldn't sleep, watch TV, or even have a conversation inside my house. So any protocols incented to safeguard anybody's rights as it applies to this new discretionary development, the CCV, will be greeted with little or no faith. No, nobody should be, have to wait and stand idle or rely on council staff reviews at a later date to ensure all stakeholders' concerns are dispositioned and rights protected just to enable the CCV foundation to be poured as soon as possible. Community concerns should be addressed before approvals and the concrete is pouring. Some other concerns but not all of them regarding the CCV footprint alteration plan as fo are as follows. Proximity to the two-story commercial enterprise to all nearby residents. Excessive noise and lightning gen lighting generated by the operation, maintenance, and delivery in special events. Traffic and parking concerns at the location and the surrounding streets. The transportation master plan parameters should be applied to the CCV, and you're going to see there's a lot of issues. Safety, personal and property security issues, signage. Current bylaws are inadequate to the new LED lighting and animations. Hours of operations are still excessive. Liquor consumption, an added amplifier to all my concerns. Passing over three minutes there, Mr. Roland. So we can wrap it up. public waterfront in the community experience such as significant population growth with discretionary development will create far more demand on these limited resources, the waterfront and the beach than originally projected. Some degree of waterfront development is welcome, but, we, but re, it needs to be responsible. And compromise will only be the key to having community support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the open forum uh, for this evening. And we'll move on now to 5.1 delegations. And we have three delegations this evening. I'll remind all the delegations that we have uh, 10 minutes on the agenda for each of you. So we'll ask you to hold to that time frame uh, as best you can, please. So the uh, First delegation is from Fred Kuntz, uh, the Senior Manager of Corporate Relations, and Jason Van Wert, VP of Nuclear Waste Management. Actually, I hear, have heard that Jason is not going to be with us, um, but uh, I do see Fred there, uh, and he's here to give us the OPGQ4 2021 update to municipal councils. Fred. Thank you, Your Worship and Councillors, for this opportunity to keep uh, Council informed about OPG's activities in our community. Um, I'm joined by Nula Sietzma, who's State Director of Stakeholder Relations at OPG, and Caitlin Neville, who's Communications Officer. And I'd just like to uh, say congratulations to uh, John Davinsky on his appointment to council earlier this month. It's nice to see a fellow former journalist make good. On to the uh, presentation and uh, the next slide, please, for the agenda. We'll uh, briefly update you on a new name for the Nuclear Waste Management Division with a new mission, operations at the Western site, uh, recognition for our biodiversity programs this year, an enhanced uh, in investment we're making in enhanced sorting in the Bruce County, uh, permanent disposal, which we call lasting solutions, and a little bit about OBG as a whole. So on to the next slide, and I'm pleased to announce that the uh, new name for OBG's Nuclear Waste Management Division is Nuclear Sustainability Services. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, it gets us away from the word waste, which is actually incorrect and wrong to describe many of the, the byproducts that this division handles, including valuable uh, medical isotopes, products such as tritium heavy water, which are very valuable and precious to certain industries. And we handle all the commercial sales of those products too. But also it, more importantly, it, it recognizes our mission in sustainability. We have a, a mission to reduce uh, the volumes that we store by reducing, reusing, recycling, and a new multi-year plan to really enhance those efforts. And this all uh, aligns with OPG's uh, climate change plan. Nuclear is part of the solution to climate change because it's zero carbon. And that's what we wanted to emphasize. On to the next slide. So at the Western site, we uh, um, receive, process, and store the low and intermediate level materials from the Darlington and Pickering 
uh, stations and all of the materials from the Bruce nuclear stations. And we handle those materials safely as demonstrated by our achievement this year of 10 years without a lost time accident a performance we're very proud of. Even through the pandemic, we've kept our operations going to uh, keep producing electricity for Ontario. And uh, our workers have been returning, our office workers have been returning to site recently, but with all the COVID protocols still in place. Uh, this year at the site, we completed uh, an outage of the incinerator to upgrade a number of parts and enable it to run for another 15 years. That's important to reducing volumes. And we also completed construction of storage buildings five and six for used fuel. On to the next slide. Uh, biodiversity is something OPG invests a lot of time and effort into habitat protection and restoration at all our sites. And at the Western site, this year we were recognized by the Wildlife Habitat Council, an international body for our biodiversity programs, a number of uh, programs underway. And uh, we were also, so we won gold certification, uh, which is their highest level, but we also received the gold program of the year. Um, topping all of the 150 entries from around the world for biodiversity programs this year. Very proud of that performance. On to the next slide. Uh, this is a new investment we're making in Bruce County. Uh, it's just outside of the uh, Bruce nuclear site. We're going to be building uh, something called the Western Clean Energy Sorting and Recycling Facility. Um, and this is very important to reducing volumes. We sort the materials to see what's processable uh, and what could be free release, what could be recycled, what's clean. And this is going to have 42,000 square feet, 25 employees, and it's going to be applying the learnings of the Hamilton uh, Laboratory. You can see a picture of the laboratory in the bottom right there, where we've been uh, doing research with McMaster University on how to do this uh, really well, to be the best in the world at this. So that's an environmental measure because it'll allow us to uh, build fewer buildings and maybe even reduce the number of buildings we have at site. And that should be up and running by the end of next year. Now, you know that our DGR for low and intermediate level materials was um, discontinued last year. That was proposed for the Bruce site, but OBG remains committed to uh, lasting solutions for nuclear byproducts, which means permanent disposal. And so on used fuel, we support the NWMO process to site a deep geologic repository or DGR for all of Canada. And as we know, they're down to two sites, Ignis in Northern Ontario and South Bruce in Bruce County. And then for low and intermediate level materials, we're waiting to see the outcome of this year's public review of the federal radioactive waste policy framework that was announced last year. It's been going on all year and the federal government promised to have a new policy, uh, modernized policy by the end of uh, this year. We'll see if that happens. There's been a federal election, there's a new minister, uh, and, but there'll also be a new uh, supporting strategy to support the new policy. And that'll affect OPG strategy going forward for permanent disposal. Any new facility would engage with stakeholders, indigenous communities, the public. And on to our last slide. Um, this year, OPG launched its first ever reconciliation action plan. And this is a commitment by OPG to uh, really work in five areas, leadership, the relationships, people, economic empowerment, stewardship of the environment, um, to walk a path together with indigenous peoples on reconciliation. You can read it all online, but it commits to uh, $1 billion of impact for indigenous communities in the next decade. And a lot of that occurs through equity partnerships and hydro dams, solar uh, facilities and the like. Also in October, uh, the CNSC approved renewal of OPG's existing license to build new nuclear at Darlington. That would be for a small modular reactor, a new technology that can provide zero carbon energy uh, to all sorts of locations in Canada, in the far north, off grid, even around the world. On our Darlington refurbishment, that project remains on track and on budget to have another 30 years of clean energy at Darlington. And we continue to support the Bruce Power major component replacement with lessons learned and also um, removing the used reactor components from the Bruce project and storing those. So that's our update for this year. And uh, thank you for listening. Very good. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, and uh, we'll ask if uh, members have any questions or comments. Well, it's good of you to, oh, there's uh, Council Mayette. Council Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, Fred, it's always nice to see you come out and give us an update on what's going on with OBG and congratulations on the new naming. Um, congratulations on your stewardship award. And I would just like to say, as the president of the Lake Huron Fishing Club, we very much appreciate the support, the continued support that we get from them, which allows us to run the two hatcheries, one in Kincard and one in Port Elgin, and keep the lakes and rivers flush with fish 
for generations to come. And we uh, like to say thank you for that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Well, thank you, Fred. We always appreciate you uh, coming in and giving us these updates. Obviously, uh, um, the work that OPG uh, does in our community and across Ontario is really valuable. And uh, in particular, uh, nuclear power, I'm, I'm always glad to see the updates on uh, your work around SMRs and, and uh, things like that. And good to see progress being made in Darlington on that. That really is the future of energy production in terms of fighting climate change. And, uh, and so it's great to see OPG making progress on that. And uh, I know uh, our region and our community are keen to be part of that uh, effort and to support it. So, uh, so thanks very much uh, for your update and, uh, and look forward to seeing you back again soon. I know we will. Talk Thank to you later. You. So that moves us then on to our second delegation, which is uh, from uh, our airport committee and uh, Tony Alberts. And he's here to give us uh, the 2021 report. So uh, we'll turn it over to you, Tony. I see you right there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council. As, as chair of the Port Island Airport community, I am once again very pleased to be able to provide you with this update. Uh, like many aspects of our community, COVID-19 has had an impact on our airport. Uh, and as we are all aware, we were delayed in opening for normal operations because of the provincial lockdown. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we did not actually have any aircraft coming into the airport until mid-May. Um, Due to the lockdown, we, the, the first aircraft, as I said, did come in mid-May, uh, and normally we operate from the uh, beginning of May until the end, mid-October, end of or mid-November or to the end. But as we all know, this fall has been exceptionally wet in very soft conditions, and the last aircraft did depart Port Elgin on the 1st of November, uh, and that was the club plane back to King Carden for the winter months. Uh, this year, we were able to continue to offer seasonal, monthly, daily, and underwing options for tie-downs along with 100 dive gas, uh, low lead dive gas uh, was made available for visiting pilots and any aircraft that needed it. Now, there were approximately 575 recorded movements during the season this year. And as I've explained before, an aircraft movement is basically a takeoff or, or a landing of any aircraft that comes into the airport. Although down this reduction was expected due to the ongoing limitations because of COVID. Uh, but in addition to the visiting aircraft, our, our airport attendant also tracked visitors these are folks that walked, biked, drove in, or flew in uh, that wanted to enjoy our facilities. Despite the restrictions that we had, we had many first-time visitors again this year, and we had a total of 1,428 folks visit the Port Elgin Airport uh, between mid-May and the end of October. Now, the first arriving aircraft, uh, like I said, was the Golf Victory from Romeo, which is owned and operated by the Port Elgin Flying Club. Uh, but due to the limited access to the terminal, uh, our air airport register was not utilized uh, so we don't have as, as a detailed list as we normally would have. Uh, we were able to glean through the data, though, and we were con able to confirm that we had 135 aircraft uh, visit Port Elgin this summer from 47 different airports across the country, many of which were here in Ontario. Uh, many pilots and passengers came here for the first time wishing to take advantage of the proximity to the beach and the cool waters of Lake Huron. Uh, visitors came for various reasons. Uh, I had a number of folks uh, re re remind me that and often we, we don't realize that we have this lovely lake here on, at, our, at our fingertips. There are very few airports in the province of Ontario where you can actually come into and walk to the beach. And, and we had folks come in and do that this summer that were very appreciative of what we had here to offer for them. With the access to the shore, uh, rail trail, uh, they could take a, a bite from the airport and be downtown in, 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 in no time at all. Uh, one of our visitors this year, uh, and I did share this with council earlier in the year, was Jeff Gart Short from the Breslau Copa flight in Kitchener. Uh, he was here in July and I chatted with him for quite a while and he wrote a lovely article in regards to our airport referring to the Port Elgin Airport as a hidden gem. Uh, if you have not had a chance to, to, to read that article, please uh, let me know. I'll be more than happy to send the link out to folks again. Uh, it certainly uh, has generated a fair bit of interest uh, for us from that area and we've had a number of people uh, reach out to want to come and visit the Port of an Airport because of that. Our volunteer hours again were slightly down this year, partly because we had folks that were very busy with life outside of flying, uh, but our volunteers along with uh, BART still managed to put in an additional 600 volunteer hours. And when you take that uh, to the Conference Board of Canada estimated value for a worker, it works out to about $16,000 in free work that uh, your committee was able to do 
out there to support the operations again this year. Uh, as a result of the COVID situation that we've been dealing with all summer long, there were no planned events at the airport this year. Uh, we thought that was the, the moral high ground to take and, and not put anybody at risk. We are, however, tentatively planning to do a Copa for Kids event uh, next July. The tentative date for that will be July the 9th, which will be the, the Saturday following the long weekend. Uh, and I've already confirmed with the Port Oregon Flying Club that they will be happy to take the initiative on that event and run with it. Uh, and uh, the committee will, of course, support that. They would also like to do a social event in August. Uh, and I've had some preliminary conversations with lo local Rotarians where they might perhaps run the barbecue for us. Uh, and we will have folks come just to understand what is here at the airport for them. Again, there'll be the Port Oregon Flying Club that will take the initiative on both of those, those activities. There were no, more, no major projects undertaken in 2021. Uh, last year, we had a huge project with the fuel system. We did have a few smaller carryover projects from last year that we were able to complete. Uh, we, did con we completed the upgrades on the apron and the terminal lighting. Uh, we've installed a hot water heater in the terminal, which is the first time that, that, that our guys had hot water out there in a long, long time. So he was very happy to see the hot water in the terminal building once again. And we completed rolling of the entire airport runway and taxiway in the spring uh, that allowed for a much smoother uh, departure and arrival for air aircraft that were coming in. At the end, at the, uh, at the time this report was written, the, the current balance uh, on our uh, grant from 2020 was, or for 2021 was $833. Uh, there is still outstanding invoicing for fuel uh, that will be coming off of that. Uh, but any remaining grant that, that is uh, left will, of course, be, be moved into uh, the airport reserve for future use uh, and any projects we might do. The Meridian Bank account that the airport committee runs at the end, at the end of October was slightly uh, above its closing of 2020 by $437. Uh, there will, however, be a reduction in that as we have yet again had final billing for phone and hydro for the balance of the year. I'm pleased to report that we have continued to foster a positive and collaborative relationship with the municipal staff. You know, you folks uh, at, the, at the municipality that work with us are amazing. Uh, anytime we need support, we always get it and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, last year, we did not request an increase in our 2021 grant. Uh, however, due to the continued increase in the operating costs of the facility, and mostly it's in, in liability insurance, uh, we, there will be a, a modest increase request uh, in the 2022 grant, uh, and that was passed at our September uh, committee meeting, and that um, amount has been forwarded on to council for inclusion in the, in the uh, budgeting process for 2022. As, if, if, it is, if it is approved as, re, as requested, we'll be at $25,280 will be our grant request for 2022, um, and I, I hope you folks will be able to do that. And that will allow us to continue to uh, function in the way that we do. Uh, and we function currently through the manager of parks and rec, uh, Frank Burroughs. In conclusion, I would just like to, again, thank the municipality for the support that the, the Port Oregon Airport continues to get. It is recognized in the aviation community as one of the best grass strips in Ontario. I encourage any of you or all of you to come up and visit us any anytime. And if there's have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them at this point. Thanks very much, Tony. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Don't see any. Oh, oh Councillor Mayette. Councillor Mayette always waits until I'm just about to wrap it up and he jumps three times. Because uh, he, he was eating his peanuts. Yeah. Nobody yeah, gets fine. off. Nobody gets off uh, without a question. No worries. No worries. It's all good. Thanks, Tony, for the report. I miss you guys. I was on the airport committee before, and uh, I know the great work you do. The club, Tony. A yes. lot of people. A lot of people don't probably realize. I, I know you mentioned you have ten members of the club. I presume that's 10 pilots. Correct. Um, how, many, how many could the club accommodate? And if a person, and I'm not talking about myself, I'm too big to fit in that airplane, but uh, how would a person who's interested in learning how to fly and uh, doesn't necessarily have the wherewithal to purchase an airplane become involved with your club? It's, simp it's as simple as reaching out to myself or any member of the, of the club executive. Um, <laughs> What folks have to understand is they, they need to come to the club with a license. We, we, the, the aircraft cannot be used for initial training. It can be used for upgrade training. 
Um, but we always welcome new members to the club. Right, right now with our 10 members, we are not utilizing the aircraft as much as we would like to. Uh, we could easily accommodate another five to 10 members and, and not be in a position where folks can't get the plane when they want it. So um, it's, it's easy. Like you can email myself. There's a, the Flying Club has a Facebook page. You can message us through it. Um, and, and we're also on the town web page under the rec items with contact information there as well. That's, that's great, Tony. And thanks. I'm sure there's lots of people who have a dream of flying and, uh, and there's an opportunity there to do it within a, a regular layman's budget. Thank you. I, I keep working on Mr. Hardy. Any further questions or comments? I, so I just want to say uh, thanks to you, uh, Tony, and to Kevin Yerskavich and Randy Linton and Bill Reaney, and of course, Councillors Carr and Schreider for uh, their work on the airport uh, committee. And I want to say uh, thanks to, to you in particular, Tony. I, you, uh, it was a, it's been a challenging couple of years, and I know the airport uh, has it's been challenging to uh, run an airport over the last couple of years. And you've been uh, uh, you've persevered and you've been very patient uh, when you needed to be, but you but. Uh, um, uh, and we sorry, I certainly uh, um, appreciated that and, and working with you through the through the COVID uh, situation. And hopefully, we have that behind us, and the airport can be wide open and running and the way we all want it to be. And, uh, and we don't have to have any more uh, anything holding us back. And it'll be, it'll be, geez, sorry about that. It'll be great to see. Uh, it'll be great to see some events happening there next year, Copa, and your event in August. I think that's uh, that Copa event is always such a great event uh, and a popular one. And uh, so it's going to be nice to see you back doing those things. And uh, I know everybody can't wait. So, so just thank you very much for all you're doing. We, I know uh, council is going to consider your budget request and I know council's always been very supportive of the airport committee. And I don't think uh, you should expect anything different in 2022, uh, but I will, uh, um, and we'll look forward to a good uh, upcoming season of operations at the airport. So, uh, so thank you. Oh, no, no worries. All right. Uh, so with that, we're moving on to our third and final delegation, uh, and it is from Pat Sanigan from the CFUW, and uh, she is here to talk to us about the 31st Annual Vigil Against Violence Against Women. Ms. Sanigan. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and councillors and town staff. The Canadian Federation of University Women Southport appreciates this opportunity to bring you all up to date with the current issues around gender-based violence and see how we can work together to find uh, an end. Um, and we can go to the first next slide. So uh, yes, uh, it will be December 6th at 12 noon. It will be in person again, which is terrific. Last year we were virtual. We're going to have speakers from Saugeen First Nation, uh, shelter services, and victim services. Something we found last year when we went virtual is that we had an online do donation uh, service, and that managed to uh, accrue much more money for the shelters. So we've included that again this year. We have postering going up this week in uh, the towns, and this will include a QR code that will take you right to the Trellis site, which is the donation site. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So why do we still need a vigil? Well, we're certainly still honoring the women that were killed in Montreal in 1989 and increasing awareness around all the women who experienced gender-based violence. You can go to the next slide. But nationally, provincially and locally, gender-based violence still remains a big issue. And the next slide. So when I started researching this presentation, I thought I'd be concentrating on the apparently toxic environment in the armed forces that seems to have been prevalent for years, whereby several senior male officers are being investigated for harassment and sexual assault of female forces members. This has resulted in a new female minister of national defense and a promise that cases would be moved to civil court. Next. But as I researched that, the news came up with the women's Canadian soccer team who have sent a letter to the governing body asking the Federation to help fight a culture of abuse and silence in that league. The team's letter references the recent allegations of sexual coercion and maltreatment that have rocked the National Women's Soccer League, especially around a former Vancouver Whitecaps coach 
who's facing nine sex-related charges in BC. And next. And then on November 1st, the media released information from a civil suit by survivors of assault at a popular provincial summer music camp. The statement of claim alleges that the camps were negligent in failing to change the quote, sexualized camp atmosphere um, and allowed three male staff members to engage in quote, illegal and immoral sexual activities with children who were under their supervision. And then I found the next local item. Next slide. This is Christina Yadram. Uh, on October 10th of this year, officers from Grey Bruce OPP uh, found the body of Christina Yadram north of Miller Lake. Her body had been dumped there. She'd been murdered and the body dumped there um, by her uh, boyfriend who uh, lives in Shelburne. Um, and uh, this 36 year old Guyanese Canadian woman uh, was six months pregnant uh, when she was murdered. And uh, that was, would have been the fourth of her, ch of her children. Um, there's been a GoFundMe page uh, put together by her friends and they say it is with great sadness that we have to share the untimely and unjust death of Christina Yadram, who was six months pregnant on the night of October 9th. She was brutally murdered by her boyfriend. Next slide. We also need to put special focus on Indigenous women and girls. This slide shows the faces of Maisie Ojek and Shannon Alexander, two young women who went missing in 2008. Maisie was well known to Saugeen First Nations and uh, the non-Indigenous community here. She attended SDSS, had many friends in the community, and she's been missing. She and Shannon have been missing since 2008. New data this year from Stats Canada reveals that more than six in 10 Indigenous women report having been physically or sexually assaulted at some point during their lifetime, uh, compared to uh, more than four in 10 non-Indigenous women. Next slide. We also have to acknowledge the role of the pandemic in gender-based violence. <clears throat> Research demonstrates the shadow pandemic as has become known has been linked with all types, types of violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence. Next slide. Um, in 2018, Stats Canada came up with the, or, or re, uh, delivered the information about the more than four in 10 women and more than six in 10 uh, Indigenous women who had experienced violence in their lifetime. But they also brought up the statistics that in every six days, a woman in Canada is killed by her intimate partner. Um, if we go right to local statistics that provided by the police force here, um, between the 2018 and 2020, the um, uh, domestic violence uh, incidents have almost doubled and sexual violence incidents have as well. Um, domestic homicides, it looks like there's none there, but I think these stats were recorded before the body of Christina Yadram was found. Uh, so the, those uh, stats are concerning. We have spoken to victim services as well. And while the numbers are the same almost for victim services, um, they find that the intensity and complexity of the calls seems to have increased, resulting in the fact that they're staying longer with uh, the victims. Next slide. So uh, gender-based violence affects women all over the world. And starting on November 25th, we have the 16 days of activism which is a, a global leadership initiative. And uh, Southport will be engaging in this with a social media campaign. I wanna give you some of the messages that will be shared that um, help to increase awareness of uh, gender-based violence and some of the solutions that we hope to promote. And you can go to the next slide. So number one is to listen and believe survivors. It, it's estimated that only about a third of incidents of sexual violence are reported because of fear about non-belief and related stigma. Um, and although uh, no researchers really agree on the rate of uh, rape allegations that prove to be false, the estimates range from two to 10% which means uh, that 90 to 98% of allegations prove to be true. 
So we need to change an environment where women feel that they can come forward safely and share their stories. The next slide. Um, we need to encourage or, or uh, relate to women that domestic violence can happen to anyone and to know the signs, the bullying, the harassment, the controlling behavior that might lead to uh, further escalation of violence. Next slide. Um, education about consent, and we know this has become part of our uh, curriculum uh, for uh, uh, males and females to understand what is meant by consent. And next. We also know that the greatest risk factor for domestic violence is gun ownership in a family. And so effective gun policy uh, or gun control policies are absolutely vital to uh, help prevent or reduce gender-based violence. And next. This is an interesting one. Ontario's uh, training program, the Smart Serve training program has included now training on how to recognize and respond to sexual violence in a bar or restaurant setting. And I know you may have seen um, ads, et cetera, for people who um, indicate to a server by a key word that they're experiencing problems and need help. So that's something that can be helpful. Next. Uh, technology facilitated gender-based violence is um, something that is, you know, newish. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's very troubling. Harassment and bullying online is, is a huge piece of uh, gender-based violence. And internet policies or internet provider policies could go a long ways to supporting a reduction in, in this violence. And next. Um, we know that it's not just Indigenous women um, that are uh, overrepresented in cases of violence. Certainly, um, uh, lesbian, bisexual, uh, trans, um, uh, women with disabilities, anybody in kind of a marginalized population is also um, much more likely to have uh, violence against them perpetrated. And the next. And, you know, this is an important one is, is just we all have a personal um, responsibility to remind family and friends that either through their words or their actions, they can stop gender-based violence at a, at a very simple level or at a, at a level of policy in their workplace um, and beyond, that it's, it's something we all have to take personal responsibility for. Okay, next slide. So um, last year, we had asked the town to lower the flags to half staff um, and to send a media release uh, to local media to make them aware of why you were doing that. Um, we know that this year, given the horrendous disclosure of Indigenous children's bodies at residential schools, your policy may already be addressing this with lowered flags. Uh, we don't want to inf interfere with this recognition and would in fact encourage the continuation of a half mast flags in recognition of that violence. Um, but if that policy is not continuing, then we would ask that they be lowered again to remember the women that have experienced violence. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And uh, we'll uh, turn over to members of council for questions or comments. Uh, the vice deputy mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, Pat, thanks for your, uh, your your presentation. And uh, you know, the Canadian Federation of University of Women, you people do a you know a great job in our community and very strong advocates. And uh, you, you know, it's really horrific when you think about the acts of violence you know, still happening in in our community, and many other communities against women. And uh, you know, I think we can all do to you know to address that situation we need to be doing. And I just, I'll be at your, uh, I'll be at the, uh, in the December 6th, I think you said the day was, I'll be at the yep. uh, December 6th event again. I try not to miss every year and uh, certainly will be there and uh, provide my support. And uh, and again, thank you for all you do, Pat. We really appreciate your your good work. Thank you, Councillor Maya. It's appreciated. Further comments uh, for Pat? Well, I just want to uh, 
echo that. And thank you. You come every year and do this. Pat, and it's, always, it's, and it's, it's a shame, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it's a, it is a shame that you have yeah. to come back every year on this on this subject. But <clears throat> it's good you come back. Uh, yeah. And uh, good of you to do it. Good to CFUW to continue to organize this event because it's an important event and and one that reminds us of, uh, well, every year, <clears throat> pardon me, in your presentation, you show us how this issue hits home, right? And how it's not it's not about uh, women at a call quality technique uh, 20 years ago, although they're as important today as they ever were, but it's about women in our communities right now who live around us who are experiencing these problems. And that's uh, yeah. something we need to keep being reminded of. I think uh, I think I can commit I maybe uh, today that uh, the municipality will lower its flags uh, on the uh, on the sixth uh, in recognition of uh, of um, uh, this day and uh, and certainly uh, I know my, I and other members of council will be there uh, to uh, uh, to take part in the vigil as well. It's a, it's an important and special event and well, I know all of us as we're able to try to be there. So thanks for organizing it again this year and. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Mayor Charbonneau. Appreciate it. Okay, <clears throat> that brings us to the end of our delegations. Uh, and uh, we will go on then to reports of municipal officers and committees and uh, 7.2 general government, which is a staff report on update to Cedar Crescent Village waterfront development and the CAO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Cedar Crescent Village project has been continuing to move through the necessary approval processes after uh, over the last several months. As you are aware, uh, we have run into significant delays as it relates to the approvals with the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. Uh, at, the time, at this time, I do not know what that uh, timeline will look like to advance through those approvals. With that knowledge in mind, the proponents of the Cedar Crescent Village project have proposed to relocate the building footprint on the site outside of the SVCA regulatory permit limit. There's a number of advantages to the development be re relocated onto the, this portion of the town's property. Um, it would resume the development approval process. Uh, it would also meet the intent of the original development that was brought forward to council last year in the state with the same services in this new location. It also is in line with the waterfront master plan approved in 2013 and recognizes the approach that was formed in the Port Elgin waterfront design concept and budget allotment report of 2014. You'll see attached to this report, the revised concept or alternative concept that's being proposed for the building footprint. And I've included uh, a map as well that has the proper or has the building located on an aerial photos so that you can see how it relates to the existing site. Town staff will continue to work with the SBCA um, for the overall project, but by moving this outside of the regulatory limits, it does allow the building schedule to advance. A draft milestone development schedule has been attached. Again, this is, is a draft and has the potential to evolve as the approvals evolve but the proponent is working towards uh, a foundation only permit for phase one and phase one is the Northeast uh, portion of the building uh, in order to maintain their contractual agreements. The intent is to bring back a complete set of project plans in addition to the site works and servicing agreement for the entire site for final approval by council. That is a requirement in the existing land lease agreement between the proponent and the town of Sogging Shores. After those two, the project plans and the site works and servicing agreement have been approved, the proponent could then apply for a building permit. This alternative approach satisfies the lease arrangements. Uh, what is being requested of council tonight is to consider that this modified alternative concept that would form a new schedule A to the lease, uh, lease agreement if approved by council. We have sought legal advice and confirmed that schedule A can be amended as it was added after the lease was signed. When the project plans and the site works and servicing agreement are brought forward for the entire site, we may need to update schedule D as it will require an amendment to the land lease. And this amendment to the lease would be brought forward at the same time as those agreements. So what is in front of council tonight, as I said, is a twofold recommendation. The first part is to consider uh, an amended schedule A that would relocate the development outside of the regulatory area 
and on the original site of the train station and mini golf on the property. And the second part of the recommendation is that council directs staff to continue to work with the proponent to develop that complete set of project plans for the entire site and the development of a site works and servicing agreement that could be brought back to council to update schedule D. And this would also update the leasable area as part of that land lease. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, so there is a recommendation and I'll read it and then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended the council approve an amendment to schedule A of the land lease agreement for the Cedar Crescent Village and the council direct staff to work with the proponent to develop a complete set of site of project plans for the entire site to support a site works and servicing agreement that would update schedule D and update the leasable area. Questions or comments, the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, uh, Kara, well done. I know this has taken a lot of time and a lot of work by you, your staff, and the proponents of the CCV. It's uh, I like the new the new setup. Uh, the people have been asking for a smaller uh, the the um, event hall to be removed. It's been removed uh, to re take it back from the waterfront. It's been taken back from the waterfront. It's following the waterfront master plan guidelines. Um, I think it's going to meet all the needs of of what the people of Soggy Shores want. The Port Elgin Beach uh, needs an uplift, a facelift, and I think this will do it. It's not touching any of the beach area. Uh, the beach area was underwater two years ago and the water has receded. We're not going to touch that. We have as many parking spots as was originally designed, so that's good. Um, well done, and I will be supporting this, this move. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Uh, Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I have a few questions, uh, comments too, but a few questions of our CAO and and uh, Amanda Frost, if I might. Um, Kara, I was looking back at the um, conceptual drawings from a year ago, and um, you know, about based on the 49-year lease agreement, uh, I believe it was two dollars and fifty cents a square foot, and uh, the current lease payment of what six thousand six hundred sixty-six dollars, based on a thirty-two thousand square foot. Um, ground floor space, built space. Is that number correct, Kara? Have I got that number accurate? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, the, the current lease arrangement is based, and I, and I did want to clarify this, on the previous concept plan had a square footage of 32,000 square feet. What's being proposed now is just over 24,000 square feet, so it's about a 30% reduction in the building footprint. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, I know, Mr. Mayor, we're looking at moving location out of the regulatory area. Um, and, and that's the decision the recommendation saving. But I think it's important to clarify a few questions I'm hearing getting receiving from members of the public. Um, both sides of the equation, those are in favor and those are not, not so much in favor. And I think just we need to clarify a few things this evening. So bear with me, I have a few questions. Um, and Kara's mentioned about the 30, 32,000 square foot ground floor development that's been reduced to around 23,000 or thereabouts, but a 30% decrease in the size of the development. I think, I think that's an important number for people to understand. Um, and I, I guess the other question, we, one of the main questions is zoning. And I heard Ms. Ms. Corrigan mention this evening, or pardon me, Patricia uh, Frank, sorry, um, mentioned this evening about zoning. She referred to an OS-1. Um, in speaking of staff today, I, I understand it's an open space special. And I, I don't know what the difference is between open space one and open space special, but um, can you explain to me, um, to council care, what open space special means and, and, and what, what, what the developers uh, planning to construct? We have you know, a little bit of a snapshot, I think we with, with commercial space. Um, what, what what open space special means? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I just wanted to clarify too that uh, Bruce County planning processes applications on behalf of the town of Sogging Shores. The town of Sogging Shores is the zoning administrator and makes the determination about whether or not a development is in compliance with the zoning bylaw. As you mentioned, the property is zoned open space special. So it, it went through a process to have an exemption in place. And that exemption permits uses on the property. And it, I'll, I'll just read directly from it. Uh, shall include a restaurant, recreational facilities, boat and bicycle rentals, 
and a boat clubhouse leased by the town of Sogging Shores for the federal government or any accessory retail facilities existing on the date of passing of the bylaw. Additionally, community events and special events may be permitted from time to time, such as an event that has been licensed or authorized by the town of Sogging Shores. So it's a specific uh, amendment that was put into the bylaw to recognize those uses on this property. Okay, that helps uh, to clarify. I just have had that question asked about the- I just, uh, could I just put a fine point on that question, Kara? Does the, what's being proposed here comply with the zoning bylaw? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, it's my understanding from viewing the revised plans again that the, uh, the top floor of the main um, two-story building, the A building, two stories, is marked as rentable space and Whitefish Grill building will include the actual restaurant and rooftop patio. Is that correct, Karen? Have I got that right with looking at the mapping? Yeah, so I clarified this with the proponent and what they mean by rental space is that it is going to be space that's available for retail uses. So as acknowledged in the bylaw, there is accessory retail facilities that are permitted. And so they're looking at uses like, um, I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I'm accurate, uh, candy store, harbor shop to, to service the boaters, um, saddle, stand up paddle board rentals, that sort of uses that would be available in that space. And sorry, did you ask me a second part to that question? Well, no, no, that that's helpful. I just, okay. you know, I, I saw that on the on the sketch here. I'm looking at it. Is it's 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 rentable space and and uh, Whitefish Grill, and then there's rental space two story. I just want to clarify that the Whitefish Grill um, top floor restaurant uh, and is joined on, on the top over to the rooftop patio, but underneath the rentable space, I just I just want to make clear. It's, it, it's, it's not a banquet hall. What I'm hearing from you tonight is that it's rentable space for the candy shops and other, other types of businesses that can be sent up as, you know, that can be leased out as a rentable space. I just want to, I just want to make that clear tonight that that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's correct. I would use the language that it is a, like commercial tenant space. Uh, I think when they used the word rental, rental, they were thinking in their own contest that it's rented from them, but it's commercial retail space. Okay, I appreciate that. Well, well, I mean, one of the one of the things I've heard over the last year a, a lot of is that um, the the banquet hall is not not an acceptable uh, use at our Port Augan waterfront. I've heard that repeatedly from a number of people. There are other people that said to me please bring in the banquet hall. So I, I've heard both sides of it, but I did hear a lot about the banquet hall is not the right use of Port Algon Waterfront. I'm hearing that that's out of the picture. It's been, uh, it's been removed. So I just want to have that verified tonight. In terms of landscaping, um, I, you know, some, I, I, I believe that landscaping in the area needs to be enhanced uh, to ensure we have an attractive, welcoming development. And, and I guess the question is, um, Kara, Amanda, when will we see a landscape plan for the future development? I guess it's down the line because we're improving the moving of the space tonight. I get, I understand that part, but when, at, at what point will we see a, what, what the landscaping will look like for, uh, for the new development? Thank you for the question. Yeah, so a landscape plan will form part of those project plans. So it'll be one piece of those project plans when they come back to council. Okay, thanks for that. The um, parking, and I think our deputy mayor mentioned it this evening, and I think the revised plan shows about 40 parking spots. And I think, I, I believe a year ago, I heard around 250 was the current number of parking places you know, at our Port Out Waterfront. And that 40 is just around the development. It leaves a whole lot of sand area from Elgin through to Green. And I guess, Amanda, whether you want to answer Shakira again, but yeah, and I maybe it's a little bit of a loaded question. We probably you probably can't answer this tonight, but you think we'll end up with the same number of current uh, current parking spaces as in the previous years? More parking spaces, less. I hope our objective would be end up with the same, if not more. At what point in time will we know what the parking will be? If we prove this this evening to move the development into the non-regulated area, at what point in time did we discuss a parking plan? 
I'm happy to answer that, Kara, if you're okay with that. Sure, sure. Thank you for the question and, and through you, Mr. Mayor. If you recall, Vice Deputy Mayor, the Harbor Street parking and sanitary sewer project from a number of years ago, we held off doing the public processes to see where we got with CCV. So what we propose to do is carry forward the entire parking considerations and use of that space from Elgin Street South to Izzard. So as part of that, we'll do that public consultation and that will help determine the number of parking spaces and use of that entire area. So I can't guarantee uh, fewer, the same or more, but I can guarantee that we'll take the public input and come up with the best plan for that entire area coming okay, forward in 2022. Thanks for that, Amanda. Just a final comment, Mr. Mayor. I, did, I want to make a comment about the development. You know, it's been a it's been a, a rough year, year and a half for for members of council, members of the community who support the development, member of the community, members of the community who don't support the development. It's been a it's been a it's been a long long journey here. And um, no matter what decision we make here this evening, I'm sure there'll be some still still not happy if if we decide to make to make the decision to move. You know permit the development to be moved into the non-regulatory area back up into Harbour and Elgin. I, I guess I look at the banquet hall has been removed. That was one of the main bones of contention. Um, one of the questions was, you know, the, the parking lot area was going to be closed from Elgin Street to Green. Uh, you, you know, maybe perhaps no traffic will flow through there. We don't know that yet, but that could be reopened up. I hear that the development tonight uh, is, has been reduced in size by approximately 30 percent from 32,000 square feet down to 23, 24,000 square feet. Um, and I and I think the RFP originally was 100,000 square feet I found out today and it's been reduced to about 88,000 square feet or 12 percent less. So I, I I would have a lot of difficulty not not supporting this and and, uh, and I will be supporting the recommendation tonight because um, I, I, I just think that there's been been concessions here there's been a lot of changes um you know no matter what we decide here tonight it still probably won't be popular but uh i, I think i think this development has come far enough i i know i've said to some constituents over the past six months just be patient the system will play out and i met that i met that uh, i received an email from a person today he said please be patient the vice deputy mayor said please be patient and well it, it'll be worked out well i think it is getting worked out i um, I, I think it's come a long ways. So I will be supporting the recommendation tonight. Okay, thank you. Further questions, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and uh, some of my questions have been answered already um, because of previous questions uh, from my colleagues, but I do have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, one is a follow-up to the zoning question. So under the current zoning, what is the maximum height permitted in that zone? Thank of, you for uh, the question. Oh, yeah, thank you for the question. The maximum height is 10 meters. Okay. And uh, with regard to the, uh, on the diagram at the Northeast end, it's referring to a commercial space that is in market building. Um, that is one story. That's correct, yeah. Okay, and um, what would be the possible uses of that commercial space? I, I understand the market would be sort of a replacement of the flea market, similar to the original proposal, but what, what about the commercial space? Yeah, just let me pull up the uses here, Councillor. Um, so the uses as we've identified interior to the structure right now are an ice cream store, activity space, market, plus there's additional market stalls, washroom, commercial retail space, kitchen, and then we have the white fish grill and the patio. That's the, the uses in the entirety of the development. So I'm, I'm sorry, if there's a specific area you want to speak to, I'll need to speak to, I'll just have to make sure I'm clear on the diagram where we're both at. No, I, I mean, it, I'm assuming then that, that commercial, when that reference, the, the area that is the farthest to the north, which is labeled commercial, that would be those uses that you just um, uh, described would be, that would be limited uh, to those types of, of uses. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I do have uh, another question related to parking. 
So on the diagram, the large area, the town space parking, um, is that that is still to be sand as it is now? I'm, I'm gonna let Amanda just came off mute. I'll let her jump in on that one as well. Thank you. Uh... Uh, CAO Mile, Van Mile and through you, Mr. Mayor. The plan for that is to go out to the public as part of that piece with the Harbor Street. So uh, I envision it now as sand, but we may come back with other um, proposals. And then with that, we would need to go to the SBCA and determine what could be allowed within that area. Um, that determination of the dynamic beach hazard limit um, as well needs to come into play and the floodline hazards in there. So there's, we'll take the concepts from the public and then see how that works technically and then come back with proposals to you. So it could be all parking that's all in sand or it could have um, walkways or other things like that as well. So just, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, just a, another follow-up on that. So according to the timeline, um, council's going to be presented with the site plan and servicing agreement on December 13th. That's the plan. Um, and at that point, would you be um, including um, the type of surface that would be on the proposed parking area on the uh, northeast perimeter of the of the um, proposed project, would that be included in the servicing agreement and site plan? Yeah, the details related to the development will be fleshed out by, by the time we come back to council. So, I would like to know, uh, or at least to put this uh, in your ear. I guess this is something that I had spoken. With about the pre with uh, the previous CAO about um, my strong preference for not having asphalt, uh, for having some kind of environmentally uh, more environmentally prep um, friendly surfacing for parking there, um, and sorry, I'm just checking to make sure I've got all my questions. And I think I, oh, um, my last question, if I may. So um, the proposed alternative concept plan, um, I guess what I, I'm wondering about is by April of 2023 on the draft milestone development schedule, um, what exactly would be in phase one and what exactly would be in phase two? Um, so yeah, that's by phase, by April of 2023, the schedule indicates that I guess both of those would be done or is that, am I correct in, in reading that or not? Yeah, that is correct. The, the build out schedule right now would be for the entire development to be built out by April, 2023. Uh, you asked the question about phase one, phase one is the one story section that's at the Northeast portion of the development. And then the rest would be phase two. Yeah, that's and correct. does that include the, um, the areas within the dotted lines or could that even be later? Uh, the, dot, the dashed lines that were on the plan are what I would call programmable space. Uh, so they're not, not permanent structures, like they're not the building footprint. Uh, so I'm sorry, you may just have to ask your question to me again, like the, the build out will be of the, um, the building footprint by April, 2023 and all the associated amenities with it. So I would suggest that parking, sidewalks, landscaping, servicing, all those pieces are, are part of that. So it would include those pieces that you have highlighted in the dashed as well would be part of that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Further questions or comments? Councillor Carr and then Councillor Davinsky. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a few comments tonight. Um, I can say my emails have, have definitely blown up since Thursday night when this got released, but uh, for once the majority is, is 
given a lot more approval now that we've moved it away from, from the harbor is what I'm seeing. And what I'm hearing so far, and I know that was one of my main complaints was we were taking up too much of the beach down below. Um, and a lot of my stuff that I still have some issues with were, were retained in the lease, which I'll get to that question here in a second. Um, but you did kind of answer already, I guess, sorry, this is probably directed towards CARE. Um, the Northeast phase one, just, just to confirm what Carol, was, or sorry, what Cheryl was asking there, uh, it will just be the, the one story on the northeast corner that I see located there that will be built first, so not the white fish grill and two story part. That's and right. that one, okay, so that one there. Um, now, I guess, so back to a lease question on this one. Our lease is calculated on the square footage of the buildings, correct? So the dotted lines that we have talked about a little bit as far as the pavilion and the recreational spaces, will they be included if they're dedicated to the proponents or is that something that's not something that will be so the pavilion won't be either so that's all that stuff will be open to the public all the time that's not something that's strictly theirs is that the way I would interpret that then. Well, that, that was sort of two questions. The first question you asked me about was whether or not the $2.50 applied to those areas and in the yeah. lease it applies to the building footprint. So, oh. so that's what you've seen in front of you is the building footprint. Um, pavilions and that sort of thing. I would, I, without having seen a lot of the details yet, I would, my hazard, the guess that you asked the question, are they open to the public? I, I, I view that part as, like I said, programmable space, sidewalk space. So I think of that as public open space, right? So um, I, the, those are details will bring you forward when we bring back the project plans, but they wouldn't form part of the building envelope that would be part of the leasable space. Okay. That, um, like through the lease agreement. Sorry if I didn't say that correctly. Sorry. Yeah, no, and I get, we'll, we'll get more of that information back as we progress through this. Um, I guess a little question, just because I did notice it on uh, the, the sketches that we've got so far, no issues with the range light where the location is on that, where I've seen it positioned with the building for boaters, all that, that there's yeah. nothing that you gotta worry about there. I've heard a few questions about that. Um, and then the, the parking, another question to go with parking, uh, the stuff that they've got drawn into their sketches, is that stuff that the proponent is doing or is that something that is on us to do? So what you see tonight is uh, a new defined leasable area. So as um, Vice Deputy Mayor mentioned, it's gone from about 100,000 square feet down to 88,000 square feet. Anything within that leasable area is their requirement to develop, so. So that would be their dedicated parking now that they would have for their facility then? Uh, I, I, I guess I wouldn't know if I use the word dedicated right now, um, but it would part, it would be, you asked the question, would it be their responsibility to install? The answer is yes, because it's part of that uh, leasable space. Okay, perfect. Um, and I guess with this, when I, I know you said we're allowed to alter this lease because we, we entered this part of the agreement afterwards. Um, is it going to allow us to look at any other parts of the lease when we get into this? Um, I, I asked this question, I guess, mainly because of services in lieu of. Um, with the new design in the building, um, is it going to change what they were going to be offering uh, the, the citizens, the, the services of, the play areas, all this other stuff? Is that gone now? Is that something that we won't be looking at anymore? I, I know it was something that we didn't have to agree to when we, when we did this originally, but I know it was also one of those things that was in there that I've had questions asked about the services in lieu of and what are we losing any of these now? Are we gaining any or is it still staying on track for what they had proposed before? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think you have the agreement in front of me. I think what you might be referring to is Schedule C, which was the value added services. Yes. Is that, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I, I would offer that this does need to be updated. Um, for example, uh, we already heard earlier tonight that number three in here was a banquet meeting space and that it was available, but that has been eliminated from these plans. So there are a few areas that may need some update. Yeah, and, and then there's going to be no, sorry, sorry, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it's important to be clear on that point that, um, you know, so the services in lieu are in lieu of rent, right? And where, and the uh, intent was always that where a service was not provided, it would not be accrued against rent. So, so all that happens is if this one service isn't provided, the rent, you can't count it against the rent, we get paid more. So it's a, uh, that's um, just to clarify that. Yeah, no, and I understand that, Mr. Mayor. I just thought that was more of the kind of the gravy on top of everything. Just say, hey, this is what we're getting as well with the area. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davinsky. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you um, to Kara. Kara, I, I look at these um, uh, photos here or these plans um, where the entire uh, project is set. Is that on any new ground or is that on ground that was previously used by the train station and mini golf? Thank you for the question. If you look at the second attachment that had the uh, outlines on it uh, over top, you can see the majority of the site is on the former tennis court slash area that the flea market was, uh, the train station and the mini golf. And Mr. Mayor, I'm continuing, um, the flea market, will we still have a flea market? according to these plans? Yeah, thank you for the question. I haven't asked specifically, will we ha still have a flea market? I know I can answer with certainty that a market component is included in, in the building. With these plans, Kara, have we lost any parking spaces? I, I think uh, Director Froze spoke to that earlier that we, I don't know at this point we can confirm that we've lost any, we're the same or we're above, but I would offer that the development as it sits is not consuming any of our known parking spaces that we have today. Okay, and, and just a couple more questions, Mr. Mayor, and perhaps a comment. Um, the <laughs> these questions need to be asked over and over again so people can hear the answers over and over again. The northeast corner uh, where the commercial building will be is one story? That is correct. Do we have a convention center? We do not. All right. And um, I guess, Mr. Mayor, we've answered those questions. We've heard it over and over again. I think a significant um, I think there's been a significant give and take here. And uh, I've talked to a lot of people, received some emails, and people are saying, get the thing done. There are very few people to me that are saying, no, we do not need this. A quote from one person said, we need something down at the beach besides, quote, sand and surf. And uh, people are looking for things to do when they go to the beach, and this would be it. It could bring people down to the beach to do things, even in inclement weather. Take a look down there when it's really raining, nothing. It's a ghost town. This would help bring people down there and use the space efficiently. As far as I'm concerned, I will be supporting the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Davinsky. Any further questions or comments from members? Just um, a couple uh, comments uh, that I wanted to make. Um, uh, just to be clear on the um, Conservation Authority piece and where we're at uh, with that. Um, so the comment has been made here that this, this moves the development out of the regulated area, which it does. And I just don't want it to be misunderstood what that means. Um, you know, we've gone through a lengthy process uh, back and forth with the Conservation Authority. Um, you know, we're still in that process. It's, it's um, and without any sense of when that will conclude. Uh, and the proponent has looked at that and said, well, you know, what can we do to uh, get into a position where we comply and where it's clear that we comply uh, more quickly? And so this, this, the, this development as proposed now complies with the SBCA regulation. Uh, that's the way it, to look at it. It's, it, it. it is not in an area that will be impacted by the natural hazards that are regulated by the Conservation Authority. It is safe from flooding. It is outside of the dynamic beach. Of course, it isn't in any river valley uh, or, uh, or damaging any other uh, natural heritage feature uh, and uh, certainly not subject to any natural hazards. So that's what we, the proponent has found a way to uh, place this on the site in a way that can assure that it complies with the SVCA regulation. 
Um, so that's, uh, and now we don't, and without requiring a permit, which enables us then to move forward uh, more quickly. So I think that's uh, important to understand. It also, in terms of um, our existing parking, um, the, the parking as you see it at the beach is exactly as it is now in this development, it doesn't change. Uh, and, um, and I think it's important in light of what uh, the director of infrastructure said, I just wanted to clarify a little bit, not to, not to disagree with her, but, but hopefully to clarify uh, what she said. If, you know, this then the parking, that parking is under council's control as it is right now. It stays as it is and it continues to be under the control of the municipality and council. If council chooses to make no changes to the situation there, it just continues as it is. Uh, and folks continue to park uh, as they have parked down there for uh, decades. Uh, and, uh, um, and that, I have to be clear, uh, is not subject to any SBCA approval. Uh, people park where they park down there. They've been parking like that for a long time and we're not seeking SBCA approval to keep doing that. Uh, so uh, if some change is requested or if we decide we're gonna do something different, put some different surface down, et cetera, et cetera, or develop it in some way, then certainly yes, uh, we would have to apply uh, for a permit, but uh, but to continue what we're doing uh, down there right now, which is which could very well be what's the case if if we don't make any further changes, um, that can carry on uh, and ought to. So uh, so there's that, and also I wanted to make the note, and Kara mentioned it in her um, in her presentation, but I think it, uh, you know I was involved um, through the waterfront master plan, and then as we did the design concept back in 2014, uh, and it's very clear in that design concept that uh, this area between Elgin and uh, Mill Street uh, uh, on the main beach was identified very clearly in that plan as, the, as, an, as a potential area for future uh, commercial development, restaurants, uh, that kind of thing. This is, this spot where this is going right now is the spot that was identified through that public consultation process as the place to do this. Um, I, I still think that uh, logistically uh, it would be better closer to the waterfront, uh, but um, but that isn't possible uh, anymore, just from a straight timing standpoint. Uh, and so um, this is the next best thing, but it allows us uh, coming here, uh, putting it in that place that was identified in that plan, allows us to move forward with these amenities that we have heard over and over again for uh, for as long as I've been on this council and probably before that, uh, people have wanted on the waterfront, a nice restaurant, a few store, a few shops to service the boating community uh, and a place to have the market. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, pretty modest in scale, but delivers those things that uh, people want on the waterfront. Um, so I think it's a good compromise. It gets us uh, moving forward. And uh, I've received several emails just in the last couple of hours from people saying the same thing Councillor Davinsky just said, get it built, <laughs> so uh, move it forward. So I'm hoping that this allows us to do that without too much further delay, because uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, the proponents have been very patient uh, through this, as have the public, uh, and we've tried very hard to advance the previous concept, uh, um, but haven't been able to succeed at that. So hopefully we can get this one off the ground and, and get the thing built and, and move on. So, um, so those are my points. and. Uh, Looking forward to going forward. So is there anything further from anybody? If not, you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. All right. And that moves us on to 7.4, Community Services, Parks and Recreation. And we have one staff report there, which is the naming of the Saugeen Shores Off-Leash Dog Park. And I see the director of the acting director of Community Services. And uh, take it away, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very happy to happy to have a report for you this evening recommending the renaming of the uh, Sogging Shores Off Leash Dog Park. As Council may be aware, Abby Bolton was instrumental in this, the establishment of the uh, Sogging Shores Off Leash Dog Park back in 2007-2008. Unfortunately, Abby passed away on December 16th, 2020. So at this point, we are making a recommendation that uh, the Sogging Shores Off-Leash Dog Park be renamed to the Abbey Bolton Memorial Off-Leash Dog Park. I'd be happy to take any questions. And 
Thank you. We have a recommendation. I'll read it, then we can take questions. It's recommended that Council authorize the renaming of the Saugeen Shores Off-Leash Dog Park, located at 813 Lennon Street, Port Elgin, to the Abbey Bolton Memorial Off-Leash Dog Park. And uh, questions or comments, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I believe this is a, an excellent recommendation. Abbey was a mover and shaker in getting the dog park going, as well as many other activities in town to uh, recognize her for the work that she's done, I believe it is very proven by the town. So I will be supporting this wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Vice Deputy Mayor and then Council Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just uh, echo uh, Deputy Mayor's comments. I remember uh, Abby Bolton sitting in my office when I was Director of Community Service back in 2007. And I remember going to Council with the staff report to uh, move the doggy park forward. And I remember Abby saying, uh, you know, like I'd really like to build a get a doggy park built at the old dump site, the old Port Elgin dump site. I said, you want to build a doggy park at the dump site? And uh, you know, I at that point that point in time I wasn't you know 100 certain, but she just kept she persevered and uh, she was just bound determined that we were going to build a doggy park up the up the old uh, landfill site. And she went on to raise the money almost single handedly. Uh, she she put her mind to something. She. Uh, she made it happen. And uh, the celebration of life there uh, last uh, week ago Saturday was truly incredible. And uh, she surely is missed in our community. Thank you, Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> uh, I didn't know Abby, um, but uh, I, I think it's uh, totally appropriate for us to be um, commemorating her vision uh, for doing this. Coincidentally, um, last weekend, I um, was having dinner with uh, my cousin, who is a seasonal resident here, and she had just arrived back from the dog park with her puppy. And um, she was talking about how wonderful it is. And not only did she observe that it was wonderful, but she said there were many users of the dog park who, who were told her that they're regular users and they were sort of giving her, her a tour, uh, boasting about all the wonderful qualities of the dog park. So um, it's, it's great that we're going to be able to, um, to name this after, after Abby and also um, that we'll be able to um, make more, even more improvements in this wonderful facility. Thanks. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Boy, I mean, I would echo uh, all that was said there. I was on council when we created the dog park. I remember Mike and Abby coming and making that presentation and, and Abby being a, a really, um, really strong proponent for that project and getting it done. And, uh, and as I recall, uh, council gave her uh, unanimous support to, uh, to build that park and to get it done. And so and I'm looking around, I feel like it's, she's going to get unanimous support here to, uh, to name this park uh, after her. There's uh, really, uh, um, I mean, it, there's no better name for the uh, Port Elgin Dog Park than the Abbey Bolton Memorial Dog Park. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, entirely fitting that folks will refer to it as that uh, for as long as it exists. So with that, you've heard the recommendation. All in favor. That is carried. Okay, and that moves us on to, <clears throat> excuse me, 7.7, .7, communications, petitions for information. There's six items there. Anyone have any of those they'd like to speak to? Uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to, uh, it was, it, I'm not on the, uh, the board of the Con uh, Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority any longer, but I, I just did want to, uh, you know, I, 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 I appreciate the council probably looked at the, uh, the report from the SBCA and uh, our, our percentage increase is uh, you know, around eight, eight and a half percent this year. Uh, you know, we factor in assessment, it, it's around six, just over six percent. Where the council agrees wants to comment any further on it or not. But, but I just uh, want to let, let council know that, uh, that that is our increase in the budget. There's a couple of staff additions this year they're proposing. And uh, as I said, I'm not on the board any longer, but um, I was on the board when the uh, budget was being discussed. And so uh, I, I just I just wanted to know what, you know, let council know what they're really, uh, um, not really 
approving tonight, I, I guess there's no recommendation, I don't think, but um, just what you're sending back to the SVCA in terms of any comments. Um, this is the chance tonight to make your comments, so. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, further questions or comments, or I guess any comments to the uh, petitions for information? Don't see any, so we can move on then. <clears throat> excuse me, to the reports of department heads. And the first one is an information report on capital project status updates. And uh, we'll turn that over to the treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this report is uh, intended to be the third quarter uh, up financial update for council. Um, so hopefully you're used to seeing these by now. Um, I gave a, a second quarter update in August. Uh, so the first report, the capital project report, uh, gives a complete listing of all projects with available, available funding or spending in 2021. And staff are confident that overall spending on capital projects is within budgeted amounts and that there are no significant areas of concern at this point in the year. Questions uh, on the capital project status update? Don't see any. How about the operating one, Daniel? So same thing there. Um, outlines the operating results through September 30th. Uh, staff have analyzed the results uh, through that date in order to isolate the impacts of labor variances and other specific operational spending in the year. Uh, the report identifies a number of variances within tax-funded and self-funded departments, most of which are favorable in nature. Uh, supplemental taxation uh, over the budgeted amount and labor vacancies are the two most significant causes of a projected surplus in tax funded areas. Okay, questions on the operating financial results ending September 30th. Don't see any. So how about we move on then? Thank you, Daniel. We'll move on to the information report on the 2022 election service provider, the clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the Bruce County clerks have um, completed their review and their selection process for the internet and telephone voting service supplier, and we've selected Simply Voting. Simply Voting offers us a full service of internet and telephone voting, and they were the lowest bid received. It is worth noting that Simply Voting was used by the lower tier municipalities in Huron County in 2018, and they were quite satisfied with the service provided, and will be using Simply Voting again in 2022. Uh, the total cost is similar to the 2018 election, so it is in keeping with the budget that's going to be proposed in the, the upcoming 2022 budget. Very good, thank you. Any uh, questions? Uh, Council Mayette? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, Linda, who did we use in 2018? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we used Dominion Voting. And are they no longer in the game or they didn't bid on the on it anymore? Um, through you, they did not um, provide us the cost estimate. They were not providing a full service of internet and telephone voting for our upcoming election. So they didn't meet the criteria? Today. They did not, no, they did not meet the criteria that we were requiring. They have a, uh, a variety of other methods that they provide, but not a full service for what we require. Understood, thank you. Further questions uh, for the clerk? I don't see any. So one more, uh, thank you, Linda. The, uh, one more report, which is the information report on the Cold Bridge Class EA, the Director of Infrastructure and Development. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to highlight to council and viewers that the Cold Bridge on Side Road 1314 at the south end of Port Elgin is open for the Public Information Center. And for this project, we, uh, we have the presentation up on our website with a comment form. The website can be found by going to soggingshores.ca, clicking on town hall and going under reports and plans. And under the letter K, you'll see Colba Bridge. If anybody needs information or wants to see it in a different format, they're welcome to call our department, uh, myself at extension 119 or the general public works at extension 130. And we can take comments by email as well. So thank you for that. Okay, any questions or comments? Uh, Council Mayette? Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. And uh, in a word, yay. It's good to see this uh, 
coming along. This bridge is uh, becoming more and more apparent that it's an important link for the people that live in the south side of uh, the Soggy Shores, and uh, I'm glad to see it moving forward. And I just wonder if, uh, Amanda, if you get in a moment, could you send me a, a link to that, and I'll make sure it gets shared appropriately with uh, the neighbours and the uh, and the various clubs that are involved with this bridge. Thank you. Okay. Further questions uh, on this one? Nope. That's uh, it is a good one to see moving forward, and we'll look forward to getting the results. So council has some ideas on how to move forward. Uh, all right, that brings us to the end of the Committee of the Whole and we'll do uh, statements by members and the first one to the Deputy Mayor. Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder to everybody that uh, we have our Christmas parades coming up and our Christmas tree lightings and our sparkle nights. So please check on the town websites, check with your local BIAs and chambers and come out and support your businesses in Soggy and Shores. Thank you, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to extend a uh, congratulatory note to Super 8 Motel. Um, this year again, they were in the top 10% uh, of hotels worldwide. And these are, you know, it's a, it's a prestigious award in that, you know, you get 10% of the, in 10% of hotels worldwide, and that comes from the TripAdvisor voters who are saying that, uh, you know, you're, and they're in the, what, 4.5 star rating, um, and, and uh, the voters have said, you deserve to be there, and they stayed there, and they're maintaining that status, and I, I just see Dave's thumbs up. I know you're good friends with them, Dave, and I just want to pass on the uh, congratulatory note to the, uh, the owners at Super Eight Motel. Yeah, very good. Uh, Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of you may have read a recent local article about 17 Afghan refugees who lived in Southampton from mid-September until mid-November. Uh, the refugees have relocated, at least for the time being, to Kitchener, where they're able to receive the most appropriate support, which will help them advance their status in Canada. I had the privilege to be involved with the group, which organized to help these wonderful people. Because of ongoing security concerns, we were unable to publicize this effort widely, but we spread the word with the assistance of the Southampton Residents Association, Southport CFUW, and a network of friends. The work of our organization wouldn't have been possible without the very generous support of many Saugeen Shores residents and businesses, as well as the Bruce Gray United Way uh, and the Arden Language School. Um, and all of these uh, residents and businesses donated money, gift cards, food, clothing, transportation, temporary housing, medical care, technology, education in our schools, ESL lessons, and most heartwarmingly, friendship. It was amazing to see Sogging Shore step up to extend the best Canada has to offer to our Afghani friends who experienced great hardship on their journey to Canada. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work on that, uh, Councillor Grace. Uh, Councillor Davinsky. Uh, nothing tonight, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. Nothing from either tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mayer. Uh, you know, the usual stocking fish. We put 30,000 brown trout into Lake Huron uh, about 10 days ago, and uh, <laughs> Hopefully, at least 20,000 are still swimming, haven't been eaten by the Lake Wolf of Prey. Um, thanks for that note for the Super 8 uh, Vice Deputy Mayor. Uh, Tom and Jen do a lot of work to make sure that they have keep that status up, along with their 41% landscaped area on their property, uh, in which I know Tom takes a great deal of pride when he cuts the grass. It's, uh, he, he refers to it as one of his best selling features because it looks so nice. Um, remember this day, had the honor of laying the reef, wreath on, at the Port Elgin Cemetery. That was a great honor. And uh, got to join the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority this week. Uh, and it it's, uh, looks like it's gonna be uh, an interesting time there. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Nothing for me this evening. So we'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Carr. All in favor? The committee stands adjourned. We'll reconvene at 820.
Mr. Mayor, we've reached 820 and we have the members present. You may begin. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to call to order this regular council meeting. Second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Ask any member if you have one of those you'd like to declare at this time. Seeing none, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments. We have no public meeting. That moves us on to adoption of the minutes. And we have the regular council minutes of November 8, 2021, the special council minutes of November 8, 2021, the committee of the whole minutes of November 8, 2021, and the planning committee minutes of November 15, 2021. And I have a resolution that council adopt the minutes of the council meetings of November 8, 2021, the planning committee minutes of November 15, 2021, and note and file the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of November 8, 2021 as presented. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the Vice Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Grace. Any questions or comments to any of those sets of minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. That moves us then on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And the first one is a general government report on the sidewalk patio policy. And I, has, I have a resolution that Council adopt the 2020-2021 revisions made to the sidewalk patio and si sidewalk cafe encroachment policy as permanent changes and that the insurance provision be reviewed on an annual basis. Is there a mover and second? Moved by Grace, seconded by Deputy Mayor. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. That moves us then on to an infrastructure and development report regarding asset management plan. And I have a resolution that council approved the 2020 asset management plan for core infrastructure in the town of Saugeen Shores. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the vice deputy mayor, seconded by the deputy mayor. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. All right, that moves us then on to reports of municipal officers and committees. And the first is a striking committee report. And it is recommended that council return to in-person meetings effective January 24, 2022, and that only fully vaccinated council members be permitted to attend in person. Is there a mover and second? Moved by Matson, second by Grace. Any questions or comments to this resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right, that moves us then on to the planning committee report regarding Bill 13, and there's a resolution. The council directs staff to provide comments in support of Bill 13, specifically pertaining to matters relating to the Planning Act, and that council directs staff to initiate an amendment to the official plan to enable delegation of passage of minor bylaws to committees of council or a staff person when and if the act comes into effect and return to council with a recommendation. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by the vice deputy mayor. Any questions or comments? I have a comment. I can't support this. Uh, I think the um, power to make bylaws is a power that uh, is reserved to council for a good reason. And that that power oughtn't be delegated ever to the administration. Um, the power to make laws belongs to the people uh, and the power to enforce them belongs to the administration uh, and those two uh, boundaries should not be crossed. I think there's a good argument for making our processes more efficient, uh, but we can do that within the context of our bylaws. We pass bylaws, we give our staff the ability within those bylaws to act with more alacrity to serve the public more quickly. We do that all the time when we, uh, for example, um, turn site plan control uh, powers over to our plant, our infrastructure and development staff uh, they can update site plans. We do that within the context of a bylaw, but council retains its fundamental authority to pass laws. Uh, we don't turn that over. Uh, there's no such thing as a minor bylaw. Uh, 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 bylaws are bylaws. Council's passed bylaws. Staff should not have the authority to enact uh, laws on behalf of the people. Only the people's representatives should ever do that. So I'll be voting no, the deputy mayor. Mr. Mayor, I totally agree with you and my apologies for this, but I will be removing my, my uh, support for that. I will no longer be the seconder. Uh, you moved it, but... Sorry, the, no longer the mover. Okay. Councilor Mayer. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in this motion or this uh, recommendation, what we're doing is we're saying 
to staff to go away and come up with a report that we will then vote on, on what powers we're going to be delegating to them. This isn't us giving them any power at this point in time. We're saying, go back and, and have a look at the, if the act, Bill 13 passes, then what would be some of the things that we would delegate to them? And then we would vote on it at that time. Is that what we're saying here? Well, what the, what the way the resolution reads is that council directs staff to initiate an amendment to the official plan to enable delegation of passage of minor bylaws to committees of council or a staff person when and if the act comes into effect. That pretty directly asks them to do work to, to uh, figure out how to delegate bylaw enforcement power. And all I'm saying is I don't want them to start doing that work because I'm never going to support the bylaw, I'm never going to support the changes. So that's, that's my view, but I don't want them to start working on it because I'm not interested in it. And it says, and return to council for, with recommendation. Yeah, they would have to come back and we would have to, you're right. I'm not suggesting you're wrong, Councillor, in that yeah. we're, not, we're not actually delegating authority with this resolution. Uh, all I'm saying is I don't want them to start the work because I don't intend to support it. But again, that's my view. Um, and councils uh, more than uh, I saw, I know you all supported it. And I, and so, um, and I'll move it then. You'll move it. All right. Maya moves it. Mayette, not Mayette, Mayette. So it is now moved by uh, Council Mayette and seconded by the Vice Deputy Mayor. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Mayor? Yeah, the Vice Deputy Mayor. I, I'm going to withdraw my uh, motion to second. I, having listened to your, uh, you know, your your position you've taken on this, um, I, I'm going to I'm going to backtrack as well. I think the discussion, uh, you know, a week ago was some discussion, uh, not a lot. Uh, we skipped over it pretty quickly. And uh, I, I, what you what you what you're saying about passing bylaws and staff uh, delegating more authority in that direction to staff, I, I, I tend to agree with you. So I'm I'm not going to be seconding the motion, Mr. Mayor. So it is moved by uh, Councillor Mayette. Is there a seconder? I'll ask again. Is there a seconder? I'll ask one more time. Is there a seconder for the resolution? There is no seconder. The resolution is tabled. Okay, we'll move on then to uh, item four, Lamont Sports Park Fundraising Committee. Uh, and I have a resolution that council approve $4,900 in funding to procure the services of a professional fundraising consultant and to cover other costs associated with fundraising efforts for the first phase of the $1 million fundraising campaign, i.e. signage, major donor presentation, expenses, et cetera. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by the Vice Deputy Mayor, second by the Deputy Mayor. Questions or comments? Mr. Mayor, if I could just make a quick comment about Lamont Sports Park. We've had uh, one main committee meeting. We've had a subcommittee meeting. We've got a uh, introductory letter prepared now by the committee to send to a may, quote, major corporate sponsor. We're not naming this evening, obviously. It'll be a quiet ask over the next few months. So uh, we've got a presentation package, a nine page presentation ready. Uh, as a first draft, but you know, these are we're, we're all volunteers putting these things together, and we've, I think they've done the best they can. But I, what we'd like to do is, uh, you know, just bounce off letters and presentation packages, and um, as things come along, uh, as we're making our, you know, board training, uh, it was pretty, it was unanimous decision with the volunteers that they'd like to bring somebody in to do a little bit of training in terms of how to make that right presentation for that half million dollars or quarter million dollars. So it's not a big amount of money, but it's really an important sum of dollars for this, uh, for this committee. Thank you. Further comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right. And that moves us then on to um, item four, which is an environmental stewardship ad hoc advisory committee report, and maybe we'll turn it over to the chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, um, as you can see from, from this report, uh, this is uh, not a complete uh, report. Um, we will be presenting our, our completed final report to Council in February. Um, several um, 
well, maybe a month ago, I guess, uh, it was obvious to me and to the committee that our work um, would be taking significantly longer than uh, would allow us to present a final report at the end of, um, of the year, as was um, set out in the terms of reference. And so um, I asked for permission to extend that. And so the report that you see before you is basically telling what we've been doing. We have been meeting very regularly, uh, for the most part on average twice a month at least, sometimes every week. Um, we are working with uh, Wilfrid Laurier uh, students. Um, they have uh, analyzed or are in the process of analyzing our survey results. Um, and they're also, we've asked them to work on some specific questions, uh, research questions um, that the committee generated. Um, so uh, that's another issue that prevents us from having a report completed for council by December 13th, uh, because the students will not have their work to us until the first week of December, we've been told. Um, anyway, uh, our goal is to, um, to have a rough draft to staff by uh, December 17th. And, uh, and then uh, staff can give us some feedback. Um, we are also working on um, a public meeting to be held in the middle of January, a uh, virtual public meeting. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more details on that um, in the next uh, couple of weeks um, that will give you some more specifics on that. But it, I think it's gonna be an exciting event. And uh, you know, the, it's been a wonderful committee to work with. Um, hard workers and a tremendous amount of material to sift through, but um, it's also been very exciting and very interesting work. So thank you for your, your tolerance in allowing us to extend our deadline. Absolutely, and I certainly thank uh, the committee for its work on behalf of council, and we're gonna be looking forward to seeing the complete report early next year. Are there any other questions uh, or comments for uh, Councillor Grace, Chair of the Committee. I don't see any, so thank you for that, Councillor Grace. Uh, that moves us then on to our item five, staff report on the COVID-19 vaccination policy. And uh, do we have uh, anybody who, uh, well, I guess what I'll do is I'll read it and then we'll make, take questions or comments. Uh, there is a resolution that council approved the workplace COVID-19 vaccination policy and that the manager of human resources be delegated the authority to make amendments to the workplace COVID-19 vaccination policy, provided the amendments maintain the overall intent of the policy. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by uh, the deputy mayor, seconded by council Grace. I guess um, to the CAO, uh, is, is there any member of staff that uh, you wanna to speak to this? Uh, at all before we take questions or comments would be the acting director of uh, corporate services. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm happy to announce that the preliminary work that we did to collect uh, voluntary disclosure information about the vaccination status in our workforce um, proved to find a very high rate of vaccination. So the policy will be dealing with a, a small group of individuals to ensure that regular testing keeps our workplace safe and make sure that the virus um, is caught and through the screening process and the continuation of our um, other protective measures to keep people safe. I'm, I'm confident that we'll do that with this policy. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Are there questions or comments from members of council? Uh, we'll start with Councillor Davinsky and then come to Councillor Carr. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Janice. Um, Janice, you mentioned there's a high rate. Is there a percentage rate on that without naming anybody, of course? I'd like to be able to answer that. Um, we're still waiting for feedback from one of our work groups, but I can tell you that we had five full-time individuals and one part-time out of all of the staff that we have collected data um, for so far. So 100% at our municipal office, I can confirm. Thank you. 
Okay, Councilor Carr. Uh, thank you, and you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I myself will not be supporting this policy tonight. Um, many reasons uh, of a few. I don't agree with the with the recommendation that we're going to delegate any authority to have anything to do with our workers. Uh, personal medical history uh, to staff. I think anything that has to be amended, anything in this policy policy whatsoever should have to come back to council and be a council decision. Um, that's my first comment on that one there. Um, I'm not going to go in and tie up a whole lot of time on this one here, uh, but the only, sorry, I just changed screens there. The only other um, two concerns I wanted to bring up, um, I just see for some of the people that were non-compliant that there was going to be an educational program. Is that something that's being provided by a medical professional or approved by, or what's what? how are we putting this package together? Sure. Through you, Mayor. The information package will be information provided from the medical officer of health and just shared with employees. It won't be anything that staff is adding to or just presenting the information that's been compiled by public health. Okay, and the only other thing is, uh, this is gonna require an awful lot of policing and an awful lot of time, I'm assuming, by the amount of people we're gonna have to look after. Um, when you read down into the policy, it's gonna affect contractors and staff that are coming in. Um, at what level is this gonna affect contractors coming in? Is it only inside buildings? Um, are we going to have dedicated staff that are going to be going to contractors and making sure that their staff is properly vaccinated? Um, I just, I'm afraid that this is a slippery slope that if we start going down it, um, especially I know I thought I had seen somewhere in the report that I'd read that we'd had a 95% compliance rate with people reporting um, their numbers. So, I mean, that's pretty good. I think at a 95%, you know, and you know, I, I don't want to be reactive, you know, either I don't want to wait for something to happen, but myself, I don't feel that this is justified at this time. Uh, maybe earlier in the pandemic, I would have supported this, but at this time, uh, myself, I will not be supporting this tonight. Okay, thank you. Further questions or comments? I, um, I support the policy, but I do uh, agree with uh, Councillor Carr on um, um, one item anyway, is the, the question of um, amendments to the policy. This is a, uh, this is a, I mean, this is a pretty uh, significant thing to do, right? I mean, it's a, and it's a, it's a strong measure. It's a necessary measure because, and I, and I do take Councillor Carr's point about the 95% and that's outstanding and a testament to our staff that 95% are disclosing that they've been vaccinated. Um, but we're not trying to achieve a 95% vaccination rate at the town of Saugeen Shores. We're trying to achieve a 90% vaccination rate community or region-wide or pro province-wide. So we need every workplace to get to a to, well, 100% vaccination rate uh, if possible. Uh, and we need to, these, the purpose of these policies is to push more and more people to get vaccinated so we can hit that 90%. And 90% is the number that's been quoted to me several times by the Medical Officer of Health. Um, that we need to get to that number to make sure our society is overall safe uh, and can get back to uh, what is a hopefully a, a true state of normalcy. Uh, so we need to make that happen and we need all of our workforces, uh, our workplaces to uh, do their part to make sure that we get to that community vaccination rate. So, um, so we, I think we need to do that, but it is an, it is a, it's a strong action and it's been taken by several workplaces include and, and I suspect ours is about to take it too. But I do think that uh, in light of that, that uh, you know, if we're gonna amend this, it ought to come back to council because um, it's that important, right? Uh, so I'd be comfortable and more comfortable if we retained under council's control the ability, the ability to amend this policy. Um, and what I would also like to see, and this is a thing I pushed at Bruce County as well, and it was adopted by Bruce County Council, and I'm hoping our council will do the same is uh, I would like us to give direction to staff that when we do reach a 90% fully vaccinated rate as a region, uh, that staff would bring this policy back to council to review. Um, I'm very eager to, not, I'm, I'm supportive of implementing this policy. I'm eager to rescind it as soon as possible. Uh, so, um, so I would like, uh, I believe 90%, I've been told several times by public health that 90% is the number. So I think when we do reach that 90% fully vaccinated rate in the general population in Graham Bruce, that staff should return with this policy and council should decide whether it should continue or whether it should end at that point. Um, 
So those are my uh, my suggestions. I would certainly support Councilor Carr's suggestion to remove the item in here about amendments, and I would I would ask Council to consider whether it would uh, put that in as a caveat in the recommendation that we would have it back when we hit a regional rate of 90%. Um, I put it to you for your thoughts. Any thoughts, Cal the uh, CAO? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just going to explain a bit of the background thinking in behind that part of the recommendation. And again, it is really just looking at potentially minor uh, changes to the policy that would be delegated a uh, couple of pieces. One, we have not put a vaccination policy in place at the town of Sogging Shore. So we anticipate that there may be some learning that happens along the way here. And then secondly, uh, the nature of the timelines related to the policy, um, you know, we're looking at implementing this early next week, having some um, milestones in December and again fully implemented in January uh, we were just appreciating that any of those pieces that we had may be timely that we needed to deal with. Are there any uh, further questions or comments to the uh, recommendation? I don't see any. Well, I would like to amend the re recommendation, so I may have to give up the chair to do it if no one else will, uh, the deputy mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that. Oh, sorry. Am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay. I'd like to move that the, um, the policy come back to council to be amended as, as both you and Councillor Carr have stated. Um, but I do believe that we do have to reach that eight, uh, sorry, 90, 95% to reach normalcy. Uh, and we're in a, the people business to make sure the people that are in our business are safe. We need that, that number. So I'll, I'll move on that one, but, uh, we need the policy. Yeah, I agree. Councilor Grace. I'll second. So the recommendation, so the, the amendment is to remove to, to require amendments to come back to council for approval. Okay. So uh, that's, uh, is there any discussion on that, on making that amendment to the recommendation? We'll take a vote on the amendment. Does everybody understand what the amendment is, Councillor Carr? Yeah, sorry, just to be clear on that one. So this whole policy will be brought back to council, next council, or this is just for the amendment and it will proceed tonight? It would proceed tonight. What we're talking about is uh, retaining the power to make amendments to, uh, to council. Yeah. If, if there's a favorable vote to this amendment, that's what would happen. Is there any uh, further discussion on the amendment? I don't see any, all in favor of that amendment? So that amendment is uh, changed. I would, uh, I would like to uh, propose an amendment then. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I will, uh, will, Mr. Mayor, are there any further amendments to this motion? I'd like to move an amendment, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that uh, this policy uh, return to council for review uh, when uh, the region of Grey Bruce reaches a 90% fully vaccinated rate among the general public. Council has heard this uh, recommendation for amendment. I'll move her to seconder by the Mr. Mayor, seconder, Vice Deputy Mayor, any discussion? Accordingly, all in favor? Any opposed? That is so moved. Mr. Mayor, I'll return the chair to you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. All right, so uh, uh, now uh, we have a recommendation that's been amended a couple of times. Is everyone clear on what the recommendation is before I call the question on the main recommendation? Yes, everyone's clear? Okay, so you've now heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. Opposed? That's carried. Okay, so now we're on to bylaws and I have uh, seven bylaws here. Does anyone wish to have one uh, pulled out for individual consideration? 
Seeing none, then I will read through them. I have a resolution that the following bylaws are hereby read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed and sealed this 22nd day of November, 2021. 190 2021 being a bylaw to authorize a pre servicing agreement with Hampton Woods Developments Incorporated. 291 2021 being a bylaw to authorize a site plan agreement with Soggy Shores Shopping Center Incorporated for 1110 Godrich Street, Town of Soggy Shores. 392 2021 being a bylaw to remove the holding. H provision from lands described as plan 111 park part lot 19 reference plan 3R2020 part part one being 1110 Godrich Street, Town of Soggy Shores, 493 2021 being a bylaw to authorize a site plan agreement with Ernest Properties Incorporated for Soggy Street, Town of Soggy Shores, 594 2021 being a bylaw to remove the holding H provision from lands described as 223, 225, 227, and 229 Soggy Street, Town of Southampton, Town of Soggy Shores, 695 2021 being a bylaw law to authorize a site plan agreement with 5035423 Ontario Incorporated for 78 Albert Street South Town of Soggy and Shores and 796-2021 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meetings of the corporation of the Town of Soggy and Shores. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Davinsky, seconded by Grace. All in favor. That's opposed? That's carried. Okay. That then moves us on to the end of the agenda. And I have a resolution that this regular council meeting of November 22nd, 2021, hereby adjourns at 8 46 p.m. as a remover and seconder. Moved by Mass and seconded by Carr. All in favor? Aye. 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 A